please rise and join the School of Law in welcoming Ambassador Douglas W. Kimek, the Honorable Carolyn B. Kuehl, Baylor University President Kenneth W. Starr, F. Henry Habick II, and the Duane and Kelly Roberts Dean of the School of Law, Dinell Reese Taha. You may be seated. Good afternoon and welcome to the Pepperdine University School of Law and the fifth installment of the William French Smith Memorial Lecture Series. William French Smith, Bill as he preferred to be called, was a lawyer's lawyer. He was also a good friend of Ronald Reagan and convinced him to run for governor of California. Years later, after Governor Reagan became President Reagan in 1980, he asked Bill to become the 74th Attorney General of the United States. At the time, Bill was a partner at the great law firm of Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher. Bill heeded this call to duty and asked a bright young star at the law firm to join him at the Justice Department as counselor to the Attorney General. That bright young star was, of course, Ken Starr. Though Ken had just become a partner at Gibson Dunn, faster than anyone in Gibson Dunn history, Ken answered the call of duty. At the Justice Department, Bill served the country with honor and distinction, as did Ken. And in 1983, President Reagan appointed Ken to the bench, making him the youngest judge ever to be named to the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Six years later, President George H.W. Bush asked Judge Starr to give up life tenure to become the Solicitor General of the United States, the President's lawyer. Ken again answered the call of duty. During his time as Solicitor General, he argued some of the most important and complex cases in the history of the Supreme Court, causing many legal observers to deem him to be the greatest advocate of this generation. After the 1992 election, Ken returned to private practice as a partner with Kirkland & Ellis, where he continued to argue before the Supreme Court in courts across the country. He also continued to, to answer the call of duty, no matter the personal cost. And at times, that cost was quite high. But happily, in 2004, Ken accepted the invitation to become Pepperdine's dean of the law school. While dean, Ken paid his former mentor and friend, Bill Smith, the ultimate tribute possible, naming an endowed lecture series after him. One of Bill's clients while he was in private practice was Herb Newtbar. Herb and his wife, Eleanor, gave the foundational gift that made Ken's idea to honor his, his friend and mentor uh, through an endowed lecture series, a reality. Earlier this year, we lost our dear Eleanor from this earth, but we know that she is with us here in spirit today. Early next month, we will gather with Herb to celebrate his 103rd birthday. He's here with us. Please stand, Herb. During Ken's time as dean from 2004 to 2010, by any measurement, Pepperdine was the fastest rising law school in the country. And in 2010, Ken returned to his home state to become Baylor's 14th president. I could spend the next hour and a half detailing Ken's storied career, but I would be remiss if I left out of this introduction the series of events for which Ken will forever be remembered. That, of course, was saving the Big 12 football conference from disintegration. <laughs> Twice. They love their football in Texas, Ken, and I'm sure that you know that your boosters are thrilled that good Baylor football is no longer an oxymoron. It has been my privilege to be Ken's student in law school, his colleague in private practice, and one of his associate deans at Pepperdine. It is now my privilege to welcome back to Pepperdine Judge General Dean President Ken Starr. <laughs> we are also privileged to welcome back to Pepperdine his lovely and talented wife, Alice.
Joining, on the Ken, joining Ken on the stage this afternoon will be four of President Starr's friends and former colleagues. First, we have Hank Habeck, who served as Assistant Attorney General and the Deputy Administrator to the United States Department or Environmental Protection Agency in the Reagan Justice Department. Hank has been a highly successful pioneer in environmental business and policy, serving in leadership roles with numerous companies and groups. Next, we have Judge Carolyn Kuehl, who served as the Principal's Deputy Solicitor General during the Reagan years. After later becoming a partner at the top flight firm of Munger, Tolles, and Olson, Judge Kuehl was appointed to the California Superior Court in 1995 and now serves as a supervising judge of the, of the Civil Department. <laughs> Next, we have Professor Doug Kamek, who served as the head of the Office of Legal Counsel for both Presidents Reagan and Bush. Professor Kamek has had many titles since leaving the Justice Department, including Dean of the Catholic University School of Law, United States Ambassador to the Republic of Malta, and now is the holder of the Caruso Family Chair, endowed by the same Caruso family whose name graces this auditorium where we have gathered today. And finally, we have Danelle Reese Taha, who, like those on the stage with her, has served the profession in a variety of important capacities over her career. After graduating from the University of Michigan Law School, she became a White House Fellow. Donnell later joined the faculty at the University of Kansas School of Law, where she later became Associate Dean and then moved into the position of Chief Academic Officer of the University of Kansas, the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. In 1986, President Reagan appointed her to the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, where she served with distinction for 25 years, seven as Chief Judge. She was wooed by several law schools, but to our delight ultimately chose Pepperdine. We are exceedingly blessed to have her as have her lead this special law school at this special time. Please join me in welcoming our moderator for this program, Dean Danelle Reese Taha. Well, thank you, Jim. That was way too generous, except for my colleagues who are here. And I am so indebted to them for being with us. And I want to say, before we start, Another special thanks to Herb and Eleanor Newbar. I did not fully appreciate, until I came to this law school, the enormous gift of yourselves and your stewardship that you've given to this law school. And so we teach us from you and your son. I keep saying those are such big shoes to fill. Uh, I can't do it, and I can't be anywhere near as great for this law school as he was and continues to be. But Ken and Alice, you have left me a great legacy. So I thank you for doing that. You know, I've got to say selfishly, I'm really glad to be with this panel because I've never had a chance to thank all those people who put me on the bench. And you're looking at some of them. So uh, I want to say here publicly a big thank you. Uh, because uh, I loved being a judge, and now I'm loving, loving being dean, and being gathered with these great people is terrific. We're here to honor a great attorney general, William French Smith, for whom this lecture series is named, as many of you knew. I knew fairly well at the time. And uh, I can tell you this much. in many ways, the definition of leadership. One of the ways that he was a leader was he knew exactly what his priorities were and what hallmarks he wanted uh, to leave on the Department of Justice. So I'm going to ask my friend Ken Starr, Star, I just call him Ken. He's got a <laughs> lot of titles. He's Ken to me. Uh, I'm going to ask Ken to kick this off. And if you will, just give us a snapshot of the kind of leader that William Fred a word that comes to, to my and thank you, and thank you for welcoming uh, Alice and me back, and I want to join in paying a tribute to her, but how we miss uh, dear uh, Eleanor, and uh, I should add that uh, Herb has always had uh, exquisitely sound judgment in his life, partners, 
uh, and also in his choice of lawyers, because Bill Smith was Herb Dufour's lawyer. Uh, so Herb, we're very <coughs> thankful again to you. The word uh, that comes to mind is collaborative. Uh, a, a lot of folks in leadership positions can become quite hierarchical. Uh, it's, quote, lonely at the top and so forth. And one of the great, uh, I think, characteristics of, of someone, uh, and, and, and Bill embodied that, is what Steve Sample, who is the recently retired president of the University of Southern California, uh, calls artful listening. Uh, and as a lawyer, <coughs> Bill Smith was exquisitely skillful at artfully listening. And he was more eager to listen than he was to talk. And then he would probe. One of the things we worried about early on in the administration was whether uh, the Attorney General was spending too much time with the Deputy Attorney General as opposed to having more of a division of labor so that the Deputy Attorney General would, as befits the office, be more the inside, call it COO, and that the Attorney General is a member of the Cabinet, and someone who's continually under pressure to be anywhere and everywhere, uh, whether at the White House as a member of the Cabinet, dealing with very important responsibilities, or simply being uh, out in the public eye, because he's the Attorney General of the United States, occasionally arguing a case and so forth. But Bill's style, and I came to appreciate the genius, uh, and then showed my lack of wisdom uh, as, as, his, uh, as his chief of staff. But I remember th thinking, and these two colleagues, and, and I served alongside them, why is Bill sitting there talking to the Deputy Attorney General, Ed Schmaltz, and Rudy Giuliani, the Associate Attorney General, and said, you know, let's just allow this kind of almost Adam Smith-like specialization of labor. The genius of what Bill did was, and it wasn't for a psychological sense of creating community, it had that wonderful advantage, but that was a side benefit of this sense of, it was almost like a, the way a law firm should be governed, which is collaboratively by partners. So we were partners in stewardship together. That I think was his abiding uh, strength. The press didn't understand it because he would not go out and make a show. Uh, he was descended from mighty stock on both sides of the family. He came from Puritan stock. Uh, he was a Boston Brahmin. His great 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 grandfather, as he recounts his work as a president of Harvard. Uh, and, and yet, he was also this pioneer. So at the age of 18, he comes out to California instead of going to Harvard College, which is where all of his ancestors had gone, where his father had gone. He goes to UCLA, Phi Beta Kappa Summa Cum Laude. You know, wonderful mind, first grade mind. And then uh, and John Scherer, his former partner is here, Bill Hammerberg, his former partner is here. There may be other Gibson Dunn, Crutcher Peebler, became the mightiest, he did go to Harvard to go to law school, but he came back after serving good, 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 good yeah, and he didn't go to Columbia, didn't go to UCLA, uh, then John and, and Bill will attest to that. But he came back and then he built this fabulous law practice. Gibson Dunn had 30 some odd lawyers when, when he joined right after the war. Uh, and he helped build that as one of the genuine leaders of the firm. But the, the Washington, D.C. press, the final thing I'll say, viewed him as, quote, a society lawyer. Mr. Ambassador, you knew Bill Smith. He was, I don't even know what that means, but what we do know is that Bill was a first-rate lawyer who built a great international law firm. And I think he brought those skill sets to the uh, Attorney General's office. Judge Kuehl, you uh, have talked about how he was able to articulate priorities and kind of make clear what he want, wanted the Justice Department to do. Do you want to reflect on that and how he did that? Well, certainly. Uh, one advantage uh, that Bill Smith certainly has had was that he knew the president's mind. There was no question about it. He had been uh, the the point person for judicial selection in California uh, for many years uh, when uh, President Reagan was Governor Reagan. Um, and he, he knew, uh, without even asking, what the president had in mind and the president's policies as they related in particular to legal policy issues and the judiciary. And this was something that President Reagan spoke about um, in his campaigns. He had a clear policy with respect to the role of the judiciary 
um, and the proper limitations on the role of the judiciary. Um, and uh, General Smith had no difficulty in articulating these principles. That was one wonderful thing about his leadership was that he would articulate principles and then he would trust uh, the people he was working with uh, to act on those and, and to carry them out. Um, and so um, with respect to, for example, litigation within the uh, executive branch, uh, he was able to say uh, not just to those of us in the Justice Department but also to the general counsels of the various agencies and here, here are three principles that I want us to think about as we develop our litigation strategies. And those principles really derive from our thinking and the president's thinking about the proper role of the courts. So one of them, for example, uh, was an emphasis on principles of, of, ju of justiciability. So limitations on standing, uh, mootness, ripeness, political question doctrine, all of those things should be things that we paid attention to in crafting our litigation strategies. Another one, again, which he articulated early on, uh, was uh, that the courts should not be involved in um, what he called extravagant um, injunctive relief and remedies. Um, and so if we were arguing, um, as, as we did in the department for a particular um, uh, remedy of uh, a legal violation, uh, it should be one that was within the proper role of the courts to carry out as opposed to something that should remain in a political branch and be the responsibility of a political branch for which the populace, the voters, could hold the executive branch responsible. So he did. It was, it was thought out. It was articulated. And then uh, the job of the Assistant Attorneys General, for example, uh, was, was to carry that forth. And I could add to that only this. There was an organizing principle that was very consistent with what Judge Kuhl has said. And that organizing principle in some of those areas is a very deep-rooted sense of respect for separation of powers. And very in great intentionality that we have a system, our constitutional system is one of separated powers, let's think about that and what does that mean and now let's allow that to play out in the way we conduct the business of the Justice Department. Hank, you want to add to that? I think you have some views about how uh, the general would work within the, depart or within the department and sort of led by example in some respects. Do you want to comment on that? Absolutely, yeah, there's so much to say. I, uh, I'm the, the one panel member here, I think, straight from the path, straight from the legal path, and, and shortly after the Justice Department, I went to EPA, was deputy administrator at EPA, and uh, I, one of the things that people who knew Bill Smith knew, he had a great sense of humor, a great dry sense of humor, and he used to call being the attorney general being like the captain of the javelin team who elected to receive. <laughs> 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 so I appropriated that. It certainly, fit, it certainly fit being deputy administrator of EPA. But I have to say that, uh, that, first of all, the time that I spent at the Justice Department, and I think it was in part because of the nature of the institution and the professionalism, the accountability that really exists there so much more than any other really executive branch agency. Uh, but I really thought it was the single uh, best professional experience of my career, and I've, I've been fortunate to have quite a few. And I think going to EPA from the Justice Department was really helpful with regard to both the disciplines of managing an executive branch agency and respect for the power of the president. There's so many ways in which uh, I would say the centrifugal forces of government, uh, the centrifugal forces exist in every institution, certainly academic institutions and businesses, as well as in government, which means people kind of uh, keep to their own sandbox. Turf becomes a big enemy of progress. And in the federal government, you can just imagine what turf does. And then when it's exacerbated by Congress and congressional subcommittees encouraging agencies to just ignore the White House. You're just going to get into, into trouble if you, if you try to follow you know, the, the politicians at the White House. You need to do what's right. Um, so I, I want to echo and underscore Ken's point. I think, personally, having been away from it for a while, but that the, um, the most important functions of the Attorney General are twofold. One is to uh, obviously faithfully and uh, rigorously enforce the law and the Constitution of the United States, and secondly, to protect the power and the prerogatives of the presidency, because that is obviously one of the fundamental pillars of the separation of powers. And I think as this country goes through the difficult times we're going through, that, um, that separation of powers is really important. Now, now Bill, 
is a great lawyer, and I think one of his hallmarks was encouraging a first-rate work, just as he did at Gibson, mm -hmm. Dunn, and Crutcher, so that uh, you, uh, you can advance policy objectives uh, through the work of the Justice Department if you are disciplined, if you have, uh, if, if you do your homework and have great accountability to the, to the legal arguments and all that, the Justice Department gets into trouble when it strays from that and tries to push policy objectives too quickly. So I think what, what Bill did uh, was he did encourage collegiality. He certainly built a bond with Ed Schmaltz and they had very complimentary. The Deputy Attorney General. Yeah, Ed Schmaltz, the Deputy Attorney General. They had very complimentary skill sets. But he also uh, spent a lot of time with his Assistant Attorneys General. And each of us had a slightly different role. The Civil Rights Division is a division that both uh, enforces, it represents other agencies, but it also, in a sense, does have a policy-making function, as does the Antitrust Division. Uh, Carolyn and, and my divisions, the Civil Division and the Land and Natural Resources Division, are more purely client agency representation divisions. Um, and Bill understood that. Uh, he, he worked very hard, as he always did, to understand what the separation of powers really meant in terms of his job and what was the, mo the most important things to do to protect the president. But I think above all, he, uh, that, that kind of discipline and collegiality is what made uh, the work of the department so uh, And rewarding. my friendly addition or amendment to that is to protect the presidency. Uh, as opposed to the president the, as an individual, yeah, right. to protect the, the office of the, of the president. Correct. And to really take the Constitution and the structure of the Constitution very seriously. You can see I've been out of the practice of law for a couple of decades. <laughs> 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 That's what happens Smith. when you get into private equity. Well, so soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ambassador Kamek, you saw the Justice Department from a very, uh, I would say, unique perspective. Uh, and I think often people don't understand what the uh, Office of Legal Counsel is, what the SG's office does. I wonder if you could sort of reflect on that and, and how Bill Smith sort of implemented some of that. I'd be delighted to. I, first of all, I got to know Bill Smith through his perfect ambassador on earth, Gene Smith. Jean was an absolutely wonderful and gracious woman, intelligent in all things, like dear Alice here, the, the, like the stars, you know, whenever you see the stars together, you know they are one. And even when you only see Ken, you know they are one. <laughs> because Alice, you know, has, has good judgment in these things, and Gene did as well. And so I got to know Bill Smith uh, as uh, it, it, the dean and I share the, uh, the great fortuity of, uh, of being a White House fellow. Gene Smith was on the selection panel, and that's how I first got to know them. And at the time, th there was just this young fellow named Starr running around the department as a special assistant and so forth. But, you know, I second everything that has been said by, about uh, the Attorney General. You can just look at his picture there. If Atticus Finch doesn't come to mind, you know, uh, you, you haven't seen the movie. Uh, because the hallmark of this man was due diligence, preparation, respect for the rule of law, and all articulated in a very non-combative, very principled fashion. And uh, that was a great legacy to bring to the Department of Justice. Uh, it was a legacy that I would then be able to take advantage of in the second term when we, uh, when, when I did arrive on the scene for the Office of, of Legal Counsel. Uh, let me mention uh, the history of those two offices, uh, since the dean asked that question. And, and that is that the, off the Office of the Solicitor General, which Ken so ably uh, occupied, is the chief litigating officer for the United States. He appears for the United States of America, files his brief, you know, with those, uh, with those words on it. Uh, one has to occasionally ask, you know, which part of the United States are you representing? You know, because sometimes there's a division between Congress and the President on a particular issue, and those can be very difficult cases, and we should probably talk about some of them uh, that occurred during those years. But th there is no question but that the Solicitor General keeping track of the cases as they're coming through the divisions, the Civil Division, the Criminal Division, the Antitrust Division, the Lands Division, is setting the course of the litigation in, in, through the heads of those divisions in the lower courts, 
and also keeping a close eye on the cases that will fashion the doctrine of the law in the way in which the president and the attorney general would like to see that articulated. And Judge Kuhl has already articulated very well what was foremost in the mind of Attorney General Smith, and that was an emphasis upon returning the courts to being courts, to have judges resolve disputes, to have judges resolve actual cases and controversies. That's the language in Article Three of the Constitution. Not to have them reach out and run prison systems, not to have them reach out with extraordinary injunctive relief and remedies that would substitute themselves for the local government officials or for the federal officials. And so that meant paying special attention in the litigation process to issues of, do, does this person have the right to be in court? Is this the right person to be here? Is he, going to, is he or she going to argue with a, enough adversity and sharpness and clarity to bring the issue out? Of course, that's standing, right? And those issues of justiciability were very important to reestablish and to articulate. Once those were established and articulated, uh, the second term of the Reagan administration actually took a turn to fill in the substance of, uh, of constitutional doctrine, to address particular aspects of constitutional doctrine as it had, as it had uh, grown in the garden. And you know, I will say, you know, President Reagan was a little suspicious of things called penumbras growing from emanations in the garden. And as a result, he was suspicious of things that didn't have an anchor in the text or the words of the Constitution. And this special attention to process, to justiciability, to, to the judicial role opened that discussion up. So it was one hand leading to another. The Office of Legal Counsel is different. It doesn't take cases to court, not because we're afraid of judges, but because <laughs> But because our role, or the role of that office, is to be, as it is said, the internal conscience of the department. It's supposed to be the place where the, the person is not afraid to say no. And so that if, in fact, upon a, a question being presented to it, that the president you know, might dearly want answered yes, that there would be somebody in that position who would have, you know, just a, a, enough obtuseness to be able to say no. So let's give an example. You know, one of the things that was most uh, interesting during that period of time was the legislative veto. You may remember what the legislative veto was. It was a way for Congress to superintend the executive branch without having to pass a new law. So they give out some power to the Attorney General, and they want to make sure that power is being used well. Now, how can they do that? Well, the normal way they do that is through oversight hearings. You, we've all seen them on C-SPAN, when, when there's not just one isolated person talking to no one in the big chamber. The other things that are televised are, are, are the hearings, and hearings where you justify your budget or you justify a particular decision is the principal way in which that policy is, uh, the law's policy is sought to be evaluated. But for a period of time, especially in the late 70s and early 80s, there was a habit of the Congress to pass legislate laws with legislative vetoes in it, which meant that if they didn't like the decision the executive had made, they could contradict it with the action of a single committee, or sometimes the action of two committees, or sometimes the action of one house, but not both houses, and there was a problem. And the problem was, is that the words of the Constitution says that laws that affect you and me and other citizens have to go through the process of enactment, bicameral passage, presentment to the president, either signature by the president, or an overriding vote where the president disapproves. That is a formula that is well articulated in Article I, Section 7, and someone like Attorney General Smith cared greatly about it, 
and relied upon the Office of Legal Counsel and its superintendents of the legislative materials that were being presented to the president to raise this objection. Um, I want to shift gears here a little bit. Before I do, I want to remind the audience that there will be somebody coming around with some little cards. If you wish to uh, formulate some questions, why do so and pass them to the edges. Uh, when we get to close to 5 o'clock, we'll start uh, turning to your questions. So be sure you do that. The other is, I, I need to tell you, this panel is a classic bait and switch. Uh, we uh, Somehow we put on the, uh, the Justice Department from Reagan to Obama, but these people don't know much about uh, more recent Justice Departments. So we're pretty much sticking with what we know about on this panel. <laughs> so last year listening for uh, the last word on the Obama Justice Department, that isn't going to happen this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> later. You, uh, perhaps later. Uh, let's turn now. You've each, in a way, referred to the relationship between the Attorney General and the President and talked about uh, uh, various ways it happened under General Smith. Talk generally about access to the president and what it means when you're the presidency's lawyer. Ken? It's important for the attorney general as an individual, not just representing and being the head of this vast department of government and a member of the cabinet, to have the kind of relationship with the president of the United States so that there's a relationship of trust. The attorney general is not the president's mm -hmm. lawyer. The Attorney General is the Attorney General, created by Congress, uh, created by the Judiciary Act of 1789. And so the fidelity of the Attorney General must be to the Constitution, the rule of law, uh, those laws passed by, uh, by, by Congress, uh, which do not impinge upon the powers and prerogatives of the President. And for that reason, I happen to think that it is a good thing when you have an Attorney General, such as Bobby Kennedy, with John Kennedy, his brother, of when you have uh, an attorney general relationship with the president, like Griffin Bell, with Jimmy Carter, and with Bill Smith and Ronald Reagan, that position uh, of trust is, I believe, vitally important. Something wonderful is achieved by virtue of that. And to pick up on Ambassador Kamik's observation about the legislative veto, during the 1980 campaign, part of the Republican platform was we need the legislative veto to do what? To curb and control the bureaucracy. That's what the legislative veto was all about. It was a check on the bureaucracy. The problem was, as, uh, as Professor Kamek rightly said, it was unconstitutional. But it's in the Republican platform. The President of the United States was elected, running on that platform. But once he became the President of the United States, he listened to his Attorney General who did his own study, but guided by the wisdom of the Office of Legal Counsel, headed by Ted Olson, uh, Doug's uh, predecessor in that magnificent office. Uh, Bill made a study uh, of that issue of legislative veto, and he goes to the president personally, and he explains to the president that a device that is being used, or contemplated at least in the administration, and it is viewed as very serviceable by Marty Anderson, a great man who's still at the Hoover Institute at Stanford, but he was the head of um, domestic policy and a brilliant, brilliant guy. Marty Anderson thought, this is terrific. We're going to get control over the bureaucracy through legislative veto, our allies in Congress. The election of 1980 ushered in a Senate uh, majority of Republicans. Howard Baker is now the Senate majority leader. And so I really some of these are names enshrouded in mystery and history to many of the people here. But the point is, it, there had been this revolution at the polls in 1980. So now we can really assert genuine power. The Attorney General goes to the President of the United States and says, this provision is unconstitutional. Now, what if the President had no prior relationship, that relationship of trust and confidence? And, and President uh, Reagan, to his great credit, said uh, to Bill Smith, well, if that's the judgment of my Attorney General, then that's the way it is. Marty Anderson was livid. For one thing, Bill had backdoored the White House bureaucracy. He had gone directly to the President of the United States. He didn't want to take this through because he's the Attorney General of the United States. There's only one Attorney General. He didn't need to take this through the Domestic Policy Council. He went directly to the President. The President ruled in exactly the right way. Happily, the Supreme Court of the United States held 
by a significant majority of the legislative veto was unconstitutional, violating these very fundamental principles of separation of powers. That's what a close relationship is and does. I also think it's a nice illustration of how uh, not only the Attorney General, but the President of the United States was faithful to the idea of the rule of law and to be willing to accept that advice in the manner in which the President did. And I have to tell you, he got this no answer on two different topics, and he got it twice. He got it once in the first term from Bill Smith on the legislative veto, but he got it in the second term on something that he also wanted that also has the word veto in it, but it's a little bit different. It was the line item veto because President Reagan very much loved the line item veto when he was governor. He just loved taking that red pen out. <laughs> to, and and he, he just couldn't understand why he didn't have that power as President of the United States. And we kept telling him in the Office of Legal Counsel, well, we've looked at it, sir, and you, know, you just trust, you know, here's what Washington said and this is what Hayes said and so forth. You don't have it. And uh, one day, the Wall Street Journal runs an editorial by a very fine editorial writer that says, because Congress has gotten into the habit of bundling legislation, that that is effectively defeating the original understanding, those are words that ring bells in the Reagan administration, <laughs> it was effectively undermining the president's actual veto in the Constitution. And so it didn't take more than a nanosecond for the White House <laughs> counsel to call the Office of Legal Counsel and say, Doug, the President has read Steve Vermeil's editorial in the Wall Street Journal this morning. He thinks it's a good idea. He thinks you ought to rethink your opinion on <laughs> the, the inherent line item veto. Yes, OK. Uh, we then did what OLC always does, take its time, <laughs> and uh, no sense running to the president with bad news, but we tried to be open-minded and retest every proposition we had. And of course, we kept finding things like General Washington saying, you know, a president only has one choice when he gets legislation presented to him. It's up or down. He can't pick, the, pick apart the legislation. This is not helpful to the president's cause. <laughs> Ultimately, we affirm the judgment that there is no inherent line item veto and that if he wants a line item veto, there is a mechanism to get it. It's called constitutional amendment. We'd be happy to draw that up for him. <laughs> I get the privilege, I have a picture upstairs of me giving this advice to the president in the Oval Office. I can only tell you that his response was, again, fully compliant with the rule of law, except that I will, I will always remember the words. It was, well, <laughs> I suppose you did the best you could. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, my, the words that went through my head was, Mr. President, could you drive the stake in a little farther? <laughs> but, he, you know, he was ever gracious. He was fully respectful of the rule of law. And I think it does make your point, uh, Mr. President that uh, it doesn't have a nice sound to it. Um, and uh, uh, that it does make your point about the special relationship between Bill Smith and the, and the president, his ability to walk in and to give him that advice. And Ed Meese, of course, had a, a somewhat different kind of relationship, but that's equally true. close. Now, that's not to, to slide past the issue of you still need an independent voice. You do still need an attorney general of the integrity of Bill Smith uh, to be able to say no when no is the answer. Uh, because it's the, pro the problem with close relationships is not close relationships. The problem with close relationships is if, they, if you get bad advice from the close relationship. Bill Smith was had such great respect for both the law and the president, he would not tell him what he wanted to hear. Just, just a slight additional perspective on that. As I've said, my, my orientation is toward management and organization. And um, first of all, first and foremost in any organization, one of the 
critical pillars of success is personal relationships. It's the integrity of the individuals and their working relationship and trust. That's true in any organization. I think it was true within the Justice Department as well as between the White House and the Justice Department. But secondly, in addition to the constitutional responsibilities as a practical matter, the Justice Department is one of the few places uh, where you had, other than at, you know, within the White House complex, that you had the whole field of play in view. You were involved with every, the work of every agency, every department, and as I said, egged on by Congress and, and interest groups, the agencies would often find ways to chart their own course through uh, career staff, through other reasons. Sometimes cabinet officers would, as we often would say, get captured by their mission and by their maybe self-aggrandizement. So the attorney general is someone who can, you know, uh, in a principled way, counsel the president when there are disputes either between the White House and an agency or among agencies. And as the government has gotten more complicated, there are many disputes between agencies. Um, <clears throat> and so that's very important. And secondly, the Attorney General is a distant, the Department of Justice is, is sort of not maybe always a distant, but an early warning system about forays by Congress into the power of the executive, such as a legislative veto. It's very important for the White House, for the Attorney General to be able to provide good intelligence to the White House about that. And just one example, since it is valuable to talk about examples about Congress dividing and conquering, um, there was a, a strong movement for EPA to be able to independently go into court and sue agencies like the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense to clean up their pollution. And the view was, uh, how can OMB or the Justice Department uh, working for the president, you know, stop or, or control actions to uh, clean up pollution? Um, so I've, I've had the opportunity to, uh, not being a constitutional scholar, but being totally convinced to, to, go, to, con to go to John Dingell and the Energy and Commerce Committee and propound the concept of the unitary executive, which does have uh, roots in the, in the Federalist Papers and the, and, the and the framers' words. But the, the, the simple notion is that when two agencies report to the president, the president has the, the authority and the accountability to resolve disputes between those agencies. The agencies who report to the president shouldn't go to another branch of government and ask that branch of government to resolve a dispute between them. And that actually carried the day, just the, the practical notion that, well, they, they, are, they do report to the president. Just because the government's gotten much more complicated doesn't mean that the Department of Justice still isn't, the, the Attorney General isn't still the chief legal officer and the person who has to coordinate on behalf of the president our positions on legal and litigation issues. Judge Kuehl, I'm going to turn to you for a minute. Um, let's turn to some substantive areas. And you had a big chunk uh, of the Justice Department at the time you were there. Can you remember some specific substantive priorities in your area that you could describe to the group as being very important during this period of time? Well, um, to go back to uh, this notion of justiciability and so forth, um, we were, the, pre the Attorney General was clear uh, with management of the Civil Division and the political appointees as we were, were clear with the Justice Department uh, uh, career people uh, as to our priorities that we should raise standing and we should raise political question when appropriate. Um, and, and somewhat to my surprise, uh, when uh, the the good and wonderfully competent people who worked there for their careers uh, felt comfortable enough to express themselves. Uh, they actually said um, that um, they were more comfortable with the views of the Reagan administration on this than they had been with the views of the Carter administration because the people in the Carter administration felt very badly about making arguments that would keep people out of court, that people wanted to come in and argue about, you know, whether the, the uh, environment was being injured or uh, whether a particular regulation was appropriate and so forth. Uh, and um, and the, uh, uh, the career folks were of the view that we are representing the government, the agency has acted, uh, we, our job is to defend and, and protect that. Uh, but in the view of the political appointees in the Carter administration, well, we don't want to make these limiting arguments. You know, <laughs> we, we don't want to limit access to the courts. So I, I, I was uh, uh, surprised in some ways to see that our uh, views on the subject were more congruent with those of um, the, um, uh, the sort of um, 
traditional notions of the role of, of the civil division as such. It was a tribute really to their professionalism. They were lawyers who knew that these were legitimate and at times decisive arguments that should be advanced, but they wanted to just be good, dutiful lawyers. Well, exactly, and, uh, and, and defend what they felt they were supposed to defend. You know? And that's one of the things that Bill does, by the way, in his wonderful memoir. He is continually, at every page, paying tribute to the professionalism of the career civil servants. So I think there are times you think, well, you have an election and so you bring in these, quote, political people and then the, the civil servants have their view and so forth. And, and perhaps that's true in some departments, but I will say this, the professionalism of the Justice Department uh, is magnificent uh, throughout all the litigation divisions. So I think there was a sense of unshackling, uh, just allow the l litigation units to do their jobs without putting some sort of artificial constraints uh, uh, on them, which is all consistent with the rule of law. And I, I would say this, the role of the civil division ordinarily was to defend the agency or to defend the executive branch and, and the president and so forth. So in a sense it was a reactive role. Um, in the uh, antitrust division, however, where uh, the uh, amazing Bill Baxter was the assistant attorney general. Uh, Who had been former, a professor at the Stanford Law School. I was about to say that, oh, but I'm yes, he was a professor at the Stanford <laughs> Law School yeah, yeah. And, and absolutely brilliant. Um, he, uh, at, at, under, under the direction of the attorney general and the president, uh, really changed the course of the law um, in that area with the notion being that uh, this uh, open textured antitrust law of ours should be interpreted, at least by the executive branch, consistent with our understanding of sound economic principles. Um, that area of the law has changed, I think, in a way so fundamentally uh, that it has not ever gone back, except I think around now, I think some of those older arguments um, are being uh, uh, resurrected again. But there, there was a real substantive uh, agenda um, in what the department was to achieve, and uh, it, uh, it, it was done in a wholesale fashion, I think, um, uh, but with great principle uh, and, and, and great competence um, as a professor of Stanford, uh, Stanford Law and an economist uh, that Bill Bra Baxter brought to the table. The chair of the uh, Antitrust Subcommittee of the United States Senate at that time was a uh, very distinguished senator from the great state of Ohio, Howard Metzenbaum. And Senator Metzenbaum really styled himself as an expert in the antitrust uh, laws uh, after uh, summoning uh, Bill Baxter two times but to appear before his subcommittee <laughs> and finding that I'll just say this, Bill Baxter is one of the most formidable minds of his time. Uh, suddenly, the antitrust division found itself able to carry out its work without any further oversight <laughs> hearings. Uh, I will leave it to the audience to draw your own conclusions as to why Senator Messenbaum would decide no further hearings were necessary. <laughs> Baxter was an amazing human being, and this, was, was. this shows the, sort of the, uh, the revolutionary nature of the department because there was an ideological lens through which many of the antitrust lawyers were looking uh, at the economy, looking at economic arrangements and so forth. There was a strong resistance to the so-called Chicago School. And so Bill Baxter, as a professor, took it on himself to hold seminars for his staff. And that was transformational because many of the antitrust lawyers uh, had really not been steeped in, in economics. They simply did not understand <laughs> all of this learning of the last generation that is under the umbrella of the Chicago School. And using that technique proved to be very efficacious and he ended up, Bill Baxter, really changing not just for an administration, that can wax and wane, but really changed the overall direction of federal antitrust policy to this, to this day. Hank, I want to turn to you on this question of substantive areas. Uh, when you think back on your time, both in both departments, uh, how would you articulate the substantive priorities that you saw? Well, the uh, you know I spent most of my career in the Environment and Natural Resources Division and went on, and that's pretty much been my uh, obsession uh, since then. But uh, a little known fact is that I started in the national security area. I was the Attorney General's uh, special assistant uh, who was the uh, 
uh, the liaison with the, the so-called secret court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court uh, that was created uh, uh, after, at the end of the Ford administration to deal, to just have some sense of accountability and checks and balances with regard to the national security community. And I think, um, in the, it, it, you know, even though we're not supposed to comment on oh, you comparative administrations, I think one of the interesting things, even in this administration, uh, the Obama administration, uh, and, and pretty much all the way through, although there was what some had called the post-Watergate overreaction, where there were many controls imposed on the executive branch and, and the prerogatives of the executive branch, particularly national security and law enforcement and, and that sort of thing. But those, uh, those pretty much settled out because, you know, one of the clear responsibilities of government and, and the responsibilities of the presidency is to protect national security. And, um, and again, if people are intelligent, they do their homework and they argue responsibly, they pretty much end up in similar places. There are always going to be nuances with regard to uh, techniques, uh, surveillance techniques, uh, techniques of national security and that sort of thing, but, but they come out very similarly. And one way in which national security, uh, the prerogatives of the presidency and, and some of the constitutional issues we've just been talking about come through uh, is with regard to the use of presidential signing statements in the Department of Justice uh, played a significant role in obviously helping to fashion signing statements because we all strongly believe that that the full body of legislative history includes what the president said about a law because it is advising it, it is the president uh, uh, affirming and approving a law passed by uh, both houses of Congress. So uh, a, f a friend of mine, uh, Doug Cox, who's at uh, Gibson Dunn and Crutcher, pointed out that you could look at signing statements. They usually are these, they're either these kind of bundled laws where a whole bunch of laws are put together or substantive legislation finds its way into appropriation and authorization acts. But it's off, Congress is always trying to find ways to, to handcuff or restrict the power of the presidency with regard to conduct of foreign affairs. They may direct the president to take a particular position in negotiations or with regard to national security issues. And you can see every attorney general, every president, really from, uh, well, for as long as we can remember, but certainly from Reagan through to Obama had signing statements, particularly with regard to foreign relations authorization acts that says, um, you know, I approve all this, but I just want to note that uh, nothing in here should be interpreted as directing the exercise of my judgment and discretion and my team's judgment and discretion with regard to the conduct of foreign affairs and national security issues. And, and every administration, every president has pretty much used almost exactly the same verbiage. Well, thinking about law enforcement and national security and so on, uh, President Starr, would you comment on the relationship between the FBI and the Department of Justice? Because we've seen some ebb and flow in that relationship over time. You, would you comment on that? Well, the FBI is a very powerful organization. It has uh, extraordinary men uh, and women, and I'm happy to pay tribute to the men and women of the FBI like other organizations of government, has had some rough patches. So it's very important that the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, be viewed genuinely as a part uh, of the Justice Department for rule of law purposes, not simply for organizational uh, purposes. Uh, and, and happily, I think there's been a very strong recent tradition over this last uh, generation of fidelity to the rule of law uh, under all administrations, so I will make a comparative uh, comment. I think the men and women who, have, the, I guess the, the men who have headed the FBI over this last generation have been, generation have been without exception, people of integrity. And then once again, I think a close relationship here between the director of the FBI and the Attorney General of the United States is actually very, very helpful. Now, what does the FBI do? It has responsibility for investigating, among other things, there's a counterintelligence function and so forth, but investigating uh, violations of, of federal law. Well, the federal laws are, shall I say, myriad. They are wide-ranging. So what are the priorities of the FBI? That's where the Attorney General and the Director of the FBI need to find common ground. And during the Reagan administration, uh, happily, a very distinguished uh, federal judge uh, who stepped down from the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, Bill Webster, and we're very honored at Pepperdine to have a Bill Webster chair uh, occupied by our own Tom Stepanovich and our renowned Strauss Institute of Dispute Resolution. Bill Webster and, uh, and Bill Smith had a very close relationship. Not only did they meet formally, um, regularly, 
but uh, they really saw the world in the same way, and that was through the lens of, of the law. And so Bill was extremely, Bill Webster was extremely sensitive to the interests of the President of the United States in terms of what should our priorities be in terms of law enforcement. The famous J. Edgar Hoover was quite famous for saying there is no problem with organized crime in the United States. <laughs> he denied that there was such a thing as organized crime. Uh, judge not that you be not judged, but everyone knew that there was a problem with organized crime, both traditional and non-traditional organized crime. But J. Edgar Hoover, for all of his strengths, I'm sure he had many, was very interested in getting the numbers of case closures up. And so the FBI was extremely skilled at finding stolen cars that moved across state lines. Now that's a real huge social problem, isn't it? Cars moving across state lines. Well, maybe it's a problem, but it ain't that huge of a problem. And so when uh, Bill came into office, when, when Bill Smith came into office, the country was very much uh, concerned with the drift of federal law enforcement and whether somehow federal law enforcement had lost its moorings, its sense of priorities. So collaboratively with Bill Webster, Bill Smith created, remember this, the, the task force on violent crime, mm -hmm. and he had two great co-chairs. And this was, I think there's a, there's a lesson in this for all of us and for modern day Washington. He chose two very thoughtful people, one Democrat, one a Republican, to co-chair the task force. Griffin Bell, who had served with great distinction as Attorney General under President Carter, we referred to him earlier. And then Big Jim Thompson, the Republican governor of uh, Illinois. Uh, Judge, you will remember full well that as, as uh, United States Attorney uh, Governor Thompson, the future Governor Thompson, uh, was a great reform uh, governor in your native state of, uh, of, of Illinois, uh, especially with respect to issues of public integrity and so forth. And Bill Webster was so supportive of that, and out of that task force came some terrific ideas with respect to efficiencies in the deployment of federal limited, always limited federal law enforcement uh, uh, resources. The Attorney General, by the way, has symbolically an office uh, at the FBI. Uh, I would be interested to know whether uh, Attorney General Holder uh, ever goes over to the FBI. It'd be just one of those curious things, but there's symbolism and you know, there, there's power in symbols. The flag is a symbol. The flag is a very powerful symbol of our unity together. And the idea of there being physically an office on the seventh floor of the FBI that says the Attorney General of the United mm -hmm. States tells you that the Federal Bureau of Investigation with its remarkable power is still subject to the supervision of the Attorney General and the department whose name is Justice. And, again, and I think, of, I'm sorry, again, one of the most important features for making the system work is personal relationships. And personal relationships are often developed uh, on athletic fields. Uh, Bill Webster and Bill Smith loved to play tennis together. They played tennis regularly, and one time David Hiller, who was on our team, who went on to be publisher of the LA Times and the Chicago Tribune, David and I would often sneak out to play tennis. Um, we, we had the chance to play doubles against Bill Webster and Bill Smith, and Bill Webster had the ball as we were about to start, and he looked across the court and said, FBI? <laughs> which, which is first ball in for those of you who don't play tennis. <laughs> 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 Completely threw us off our game. <laughs> By the way, at Pepperdine, we were able to surprise Bill Webster with the co-conspirator of Sandra Day O'Connor in creating this wonderful chair, and we're so proud of the, I, I say we because I'm still on the Board of Visitors of the Pepperdine Law School, we're so proud of the Strauss Institute of Dispute Resolution, which continues to be number one in the United States of all the programs, some 80 some odd programs in dispute resolution. But Bill was so close to our co-director, uh, Tom Stepanowicz, that we worked this great conspiracy out with Sandra Day uh, participating, not in the fundraising dimension, she can't do that, even as a retired justice. And so Bill has become a great member of our family. And by the way, William French Smith was also a member of the Board of Visitors of the Pepperdine Law School. I should have gotten that in at the outset. Thank you, Ken. I was waiting for that. So. <laughs> uh, Dean, can yeah. I just interject uh, two things that uh, are prompted by the recent comments? We're experiencing at the moment a very important uh, need to re-examine how the FBI and the Justice Department interacts with the intelligence and national security people. I mean, we, we for, take, for example, the case of the Christmas tree, or the Christmas tree, the Christmas, Christmas Day bomber. 
Uh, he was, you know, picked up through the vigilant action of a private citizen who tackled him before he set his shoes on fire and exploded the plane in Detroit just a few years ago and was taken into custody by intelligence and military officials and was, was being questioned and, and high value intelligence came from that, probably intelligence that was put to use in Pakistan a short time later. Uh, and, uh, but one of the things that happened was that without a coordinated um, mechanism to deal with intelligence and uh, there's two sides to, to this modern world we live in. One says you should prosecute acts of terror like a regular crime in a regular court and another that says you've got to be kidding. These people are about to kill us at any moment and the objective is to stop their, you know, the, you know, the grave harm that, that, that might be done. So we have a preventive function and we have a law enforcement function. We still haven't brought them together well. We need, we need the wisdom of a Bill Smith to establish a mechanism by which the FBI and the intelligence people will coordinate because in the Christmas Day case, one of the things that happened, after a short period of questioning by intelligence officials, he was instructed to be given his Miranda warnings, and that was it. You know, nothing further was, was, was heard. Now, maybe that was right in that particular case. Maybe it wasn't. But the fact of the matter is, is there was no structure, no process, to evaluate the criteria where it is appropriate to give those warnings and where it is not. How imminent is the harm? How grave is the harm? How substantial is the evidence that we have that the harm uh, you know, might occur? Uh, these are all questions that I think now need to be asked and we need a Bill Smith to come on the scene to help us ask them. The other thing that just got, the other person that just got mentioned brings up the other subject and that is the judicial appointment subject. My favorite. The, uh, we, we, we are obviously, you know, the great beneficiaries of the judicial wisdom that came to the Tenth Circuit in 1986, but we are also the beneficiary of the first female jurist to come to the Supreme Court of the United States, and that's Sandra Day O'Connor. And it was largely through the efforts of Bill Smith that, he, that she was identified, that she was brought into the mix of considerations and when political headwinds, as they always do, came up and were going to defeat her nomination, uh, that you know, Bill Smith stood at her, at her side. And uh, by virtue of that, I think there's, there is a real moment, uh, a legacy for history that is his uh, in large respects. In addition, uh, and I don't want to steal this point from Judge Kuhl because she's the one who's made it more elegantly in writing. This was an administration that took seriously the appointment of ju judicial officers at every level and didn't just rely upon personal friendships or you know, a brief glimpse at one opinion or another, but actually did what we all do in business or in law firms, and that is set up a personnel review mechanism that was well suited to evaluate the, you know, the personal qualities, the histories, and so forth of the judicial candidates. It began in the office of, it was assigned to the office of legal policy, not the office of legal counsel, although quite frankly everybody on the fifth floor had, you know, a role in the interview process. So, uh, wonderfully intelligent people like Donnell Taha would come into the fifth floor, and these young whippersnappers sitting behind their desks would presume, you know, to spin out the most complicated hypotheticals that we had written down on paper previously as law exams, and I I expect, you know, the judicial candidate to have an immediate answer, citing precedent in perfect blue book form. Uh, and if they pass those, those tests, they, they would get recommended to the Attorney General and then the Attorney General would carry the list to the President. But in, in all seriousness, the rigor with which the people were identified, interviewed, 
and then uh, evaluated for the president really started in, this, in Bill Smith's administration of the Justice Department and had not existed before then. That same mechanism, by the way, was used by Rudy Giuliani, the Associate Attorney General, who Bill and Ed selected. He was not uh, an obvious selection given his youth at the time, uh, but both um, Bill and Ed, the Deputy Attorney General, were so impressed with this young uh, Rudy Giuliani who had a magnificent record as a prosecutor, as an, associate, as an assistant attorney general, then some brief period in private practice. But Rudy led the same kind of very careful scrubbing of candidates with respect to United States attorneys and United States marshals, and the result of which I could start naming governors now and senators mm -hmm. who went through that process. They first were United States attorneys uh, and now are holding any number of positions. But it was, it was a strong emphasis on um, uh, excellence. So this, it was a relentless, as Jim Collins of Good to Great would say, an absolute relentless pursuit of, of, of excellence. That's what Bill kept saying to us, and I think it, it's an example for for all of us, and certainly for every attorney general who ever holds that office, to say, you know, we should hold the same kind of high standards in terms of judicial appointments to recommend to the President of the United States, the United States attorneys, men and women of great integrity, and United States marshals who have very important law enforcement responsibilities. Although I'm not on this panel, I only parenthetically want to add that though they did appear to be young whippersnappers that were questioning us. It was a couple of the most fun days intellectually of my life mm. uh, when I met with the people from the Justice Department. Uh, to put this in perspective, this happens long before all that stuff you see in the Senate. What happens, <laughs> what happens in the Justice Department happens largely behind closed doors before nominations are ever made, and uh, I thought it was quite a good rigorous pro process when I went through. Yeah. I want to turn quickly to one more subject matter, and then we need to turn to a couple of audience questions. None of you has mentioned civil rights yet, mm. and yet for, I know, for General Smith, that was a very important priority, perhaps not so known by the public, and I don't know which of you, can you want to comment on that? I'd love to comment. Uh, one of the uh, challenges in the Reagan administration was finding the right person, it's the, the fit, uh, to, uh, to be the head of civil rights. And uh, to be honest, there was a sense that Ronald Reagan would not be a vigorous enforcement, uh, enforcer of the civil rights laws. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. There was, th these are the laws we're going to enforce them, but to pick up on what Carol and Judge Kuhl said earlier, there was uh, a, a strong sense of, well, wait a second, we still need to make sure that we're being very good lawyers, being dutiful in all of our work, including in the civil rights area. This was part of the genius of, uh, of, of Bill Smith. He was interviewing folks to become head of the civil division, and he made his decision, and it was a brilliant decision. Um, and so when Paul McGrath was chosen to be the head of the civil division, he was the head of litigation at Dewey Ballantyne in New York. That's the quality of people who Bill wanted to get. The Rudy Giuliani, young partners at a great uh, New York law firm. Ed Schmoltz was the managing partner of White and Case, a worldwide law firm based in Wall Street. This was the quality of people that, that Bill was attracting. And one of the candidates who did not quite make the cut as head of the, of the civil division was a, a, a young lawyer named William Bradford Reynolds. And B Bill Smith saw the possibility of, here is someone who had served in the Solicitor General's office, a venerable former dean of the Harvard Law School, Erwin Griswold, who had served as Solicitor General under both President Johnson and President Nixon, had strongly recommended Brad Reynolds under, uh, uh, and uh, Brad had served under uh, General Griswold. So, boom, it was entirely a Bill Smith initiative. Let's ask Brad Reynolds, would he be willing to take on this important responsibility? First and foremost, I want someone who's committed to the rule of law. So we had some rough patches, to be, to be sure, uh, and a lot of very negative uh, press, but my sense is throughout the process, the Civil Rights Division was run with absolute integrity, but there was a genuine and reasonable difference of opinion as to how far reaching some of the remedies were. <coughs> with respect to one of the most intractable issues of the time was, uh, frankly, remedies in school cases, and especially desegregation cases and the use of busing. And that was an area in which there really were reasonable and sharp differences uh, of, of opinion. 
but it was conducted with all that sensitivity with, uh, I think, complete integrity. Uh, I know of at least one occasion when this sense of being very good lawyers uh, and doing the right job really impacted the outcome, and that was the Atlanta murders case. Do you want to, anybody want to comment on that? Yeah, early on in our uh, tenure, and this I think is an example of how government can work and how there can be cooperative uh, federalism. Uh, almost as soon as we walked in the door in January of 1981, really a call for help came from uh, the then very uh, colorful and dynamic uh, mayor of Atlanta, Maynard Jackson, because there had been a series of murders of young African American males and the Atlanta police and the Georgia police were law enforcement, they were just absolutely stymied. And so the call came, look, we have no proof whatsoever that there's any interstate dimension of this, anyone crossing state lines, it was all within the confines of Atlanta. But uh, Bill was very uh, eager in a very good government sense, well, let's see what we can do. So Bill recounts this in his book, and it's a sweet story that he sent Ed Schmaltz and I tagged along just to carry Ed Schmaltz's uh, briefcase, the Deputy Attorney General and, and yours truly. And so we met with the people and we come back, report, uh, we met with Mayor uh, Jackson, met with the law enforcement people, and, and all of Atlanta was so upset and understandably so. And there's a sense of a, a city almost under siege. There was something like 17 murders over a period. And so somehow this terrible perpetrator, perpetrator is getting away with it. Well, Bill said, let's just, Let's let the FBI use, we'd say, they're good offices. Listen, you want the FBI on your side. Within a very short period of time, good forensics, boom, they had their man. Uh, Wayne Williams, duly convicted of, of two murders and so forth. But there was an example of trying to be as responsive as possible, but just the great skill of the FBI. It took very little time for the FBI to solve these, uh, the, the, these murders. It was just a great tribute to the men and women of the FBI. I want to move now quickly to some very thoughtful questions that we've had from the audience. Uh, they want to know about a lot of things, and we don't have time for a lot of things. <laughs> so I'm going to exercise the prerogative of the dean <laughs> and talk about those things that might be meaningful to our students. And we have right. a number of questions about what students can learn, uh, law students in this case, uh, can learn from your experiences. And Hank, we have one especially for you, which is, I'm going to paraphrase these because some of them are kind of long, but given your extensive experience in environmental and energy policies in all kinds of places, uh, uh, where do you see the greatest need or window of opportunity for young lawyers today who have a passion to use the law for uh, environmental stewardship and the common good? <coughs> Well, it's a great question, and the uh, environmental field is, uh, you know, the way I've watched environmental, environmentalism over the last three to four decades is there's been an inexorable upward curve of both uh, understanding and literacy and concern. Now, it's had its peaks and valleys, and we happen to certainly be in a valley in terms of public concern. Part of that is uh, debate about climate change, uh, whether, it's, whether it's real, uh, whether EPA has been overreaching in terms of its regulation, whether it's gone beyond its, its mandate and those, those kinds of issues to the, to the detriment of the economy. Um, so uh, I, I would say two things. First, um, that government service and the environment is a great background. Um, I think, you know, 30 years ago, working for a, an advocacy group because law was being, you know, the policy was being made in the courts in the early days of the environmental movement is not quite as I think there's, there's still some great uh, uh, nonprofit groups and, and advocacy groups out there. I think uh, the government is a great place to learn. Um, the other area that, and of course this depends on your interest in your, your sort of geographic preferences, but we're, we're, globalization is real. Uh, we all know that. The United States is, as, a, as a nation, both from the, in the private and public sector, is adapting to that, and I know we will, and, I, and, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll continue to do extraordinarily well in this rapidly changing world. But international environmental law uh, is becoming a much, much bigger deal because people operate across borders. It's not the way it was in the Reagan administration when we were concerned about, we, we called them the black helicopters, where the UN was going to try to regulate everybody using the environment and sustainability as an excuse. The law of the sea treaty was, was one totem that people would trot out to, to talk about global government. Uh, this is not global government. This is transboundary business uh, economic and other transactions that are proliferating, and they have to proliferate. As an investor, 
I know we have to look at markets. You know, the global demand for resources is, is dramatically greater in the non-OECD countries than in the OECD countries. So I think there uh, are a lot of unsolved issues with regard to sustainability and transboundary environmental law, and that's certainly one area I would look to. But I still think the government, uh, and certainly the Land and Natural, or the Environment and Natural Resources Division is a good place to uh, start. Note, all you students. <laughs> uh, another student question, uh, and it's an interesting one. If Attorney General Smith were here, given today's climate and uh, the legal market generally and what law students ought to know or be equipped to do, what would his advice be to these students today? I would say uh, that, that Bill would probably say something quite similar to what he said then, uh, and that is really connect with the business community. Uh, Bill felt that lawyers uh, spent too much time talking to one another uh, and did not spend <laughs> enough time talking to uh, the clients. I mean, his clients were business clients, so let's just realize it can be individual clients, family practice, and so on and so forth. But let's just stay with if Bill were here. Uh, Bill was president of the uh, Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Bill was president of the California Chamber of Commerce. Now, that tells you something, that Bill was smart enough to know, I'm probably not going to get a whole lot of law business by hanging around with someone from law firm X or law firm Y, as enjoyable as that may be. <laughs> but I'm probably going to be able to develop friendship and relationships um, with, uh, with, with folks in business. So be much more connected to the business community. Be uh, he would also say be involved in the, in the, the community. I'll also say this is part of the Gibson, Dunn, and, and Crutcher uh, culture, which uh, Bill in no small measure helped to, to shape. Uh, but one of his fellow managing uh, partners who became the managing partner uh, a long time ago named Dan Frost said, spend time getting to know your client's business at your expense, you know, at your time. You need to understand the client's business as opposed to, well, how many hours am I billing? Those kind of common sense things that sometimes I think the, the legal profession would do, would do better to relearn some of the lessons from these great, great giants of the last generation, <coughs> including Bill Smith. Dean, can I just add, uh, just, you know, I, I also think it's important to connect to the larger community because not everyone is, you know, in the Chamber of Commerce or in the, in the corporate world. Uh, there are other associations associated with church and family. They're associated with the, that build up the culture and that are very important and are often confronting difficult times themselves, addressing you know issues uh, from the environment, you know, to a particular uh, uh, way in which the local community might be trying to fight crime or might be trying to reorient itself to to deal with modern traffic might be dealing with drugs or other addictive substances, might be dealing with the issue of human trafficking and, and things of that nature. One of the things that I think is, uh, this, is this is coming out of my, uh, you know, my uh, bi-gendered nature as a p political figure, uh, and, uh, but, but it, <laughs> it, it seems to me, if we look at, the, at, for example, the people being appointed to the bench by President Obama, they are different than the people who were appointed during the Reagan and Bush administration. They are not different, I would argue, in terms of substantive quality, but they are different in terms of race and gender. There's almost twice as many women and minorities being appointed to the bench now than under either the Bush or Reagan administrations. So one of the things I think that's a lesson to us is, is that there's no reason to let, let, leave anybody out. Uh, all of those folks, you know, from the business community as well as those who are seeking to strive to start a business or are seeking to strive to have a, uh, you know, a home for uh, those in need of assisted living care or those who are uh, operating to meet the needs of the local community in other ways are also good fellow travelers for lawyers and wonderful opportunities to, to be like, I think you and I like this quote together, Dean, and it's a, it's a quote of a former Solicitor General. You know, whenever lawyers are asked, you know, what is it you do? 
You know, and the best answer I always thought was the one given by John W. Davis, and I can't remember it perfectly, but it, he said, you know, it, it's true that we paint no pictures, we write no great books, we, uh, we do little that actually meets the human eye, except this, we take up other people's burdens and we make it possible for as many people to live in peace as, as they can. And what a great gift it is to think of the law as taking up other people's burdens, whether it be the burden of somebody starting a new corporation or expanding their workforce or somebody just seeking to provide aid and assistance for medical care or welfare or for the support of religious freedom. That's the great thing about law education is that it introduces you to all those worlds and there's no reason to shut any door prematurely. Well, that was a very elegant, eloquent statement. Uh, I was asked specifically what would Bill say, and I think he might very well say something as eloquent as you did. You do inspire me to note that uh, uh, consistent with Bill's practical common sense, uh, he was also head of the World Affairs Council of Los Angeles. He was the head of town hall. I could keep going. The point is, he was genuinely a pillar of the community. He was a lawyer statesman uh, in the great, great uh, tradition of, of an Atticus uh, Finch. Uh, so uh, I would say Bill would, would say, uh, uh, let's broaden the lens uh, that lawyers sometimes have a tendency to, shall I say, confine the ambit of their interests and they should considerably broaden it. Especially, he was a global guy before we started thinking of mm -hmm. this being the 21st century, is, which he didn't live to see, to, uh, to, to be a global century. He was, he was already there. He was there and thinking about the future of our country and the kinds of people we should be connecting with. He was extremely global in his, in his thinking and his outreach. And he also was, by the way, very involved in legal aid. So uh, he's, a, he's a great example to all of us, quite consistent with what the ambassadors very eloquently said. I think that's an absolutely wonderful place to stop. I need to give a little what? commercial message uh, on just this topic. The Law Review Symposium here this spring will be on this topic of all the roles that lawyers can play and what the lawyer of the future both should be trained to do and should be inspired to do in the, in the context of these remarks. Are we so fortunate at Pepperdine to have these great people gathered here to remember an administration and a person who stands as a model just, not just for the period that he served and was called to serve, but who brings some principles that can inform, I think, the current day and the days going forward. Principles of articulating priorities, a calm and prepared leadership style, a person out in the community, a person who cares a lot about the globe, a person who is in philanthropic efforts. All of the things that General Smith was is what we strive to inspire our lawyer patriots of the future to be. We are grateful, so grateful at Pepperdine for your contributions both to our nation and our world and to this great university. Thank you so much. You. Let's give them a hand. Well done. What a fitting tribute to a man who is uh, worthy of all the attention that he's been given. Uh, thank you for coming to help us honor the memory of William French Smith and to be part of uh, what's happening here at Pepperdine University School of Law.